Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. This is episode number 181. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined today by a very special guest, Rick Hogue from Virtual Legality and Hogue Law, and of course, Last Stand Media's legal analyst. Welcome. I haven't seen you in a while. How are you? That's right. It's been a little while. Well, you know, the video game industry has been so calm during that period of time. Yes. Uh, but uh, no, thank you for having me back here. I love talking about business and law and, and video games, right? You can talk about business and law and boring stuff, sure. You throw in video games, you get some fun. And certainly the video game industry has given us a lot to talk about. No, no doubt about it. And I've been trying to line things up with you to try to get you back on a spoiler cast as well, because people do like your just general game analysis, but I'm not doing my job. (laughs) Right. Exactly. And we're in a play what you want to play kind of mentality. So we had the kind of the the nexus of us connecting just has to be, and it will be again. So we'll have you. Yeah, I'm I'm halfway through everything, right? I'm halfway through everything before the next shiny thing comes out. Uh, And that's uh, no, to, to my fans, whoever they might be, uh, Colin has reached out and asked me to participate in, in some things. And I've been like, I, I don't I don't have that game finished. Yeah, so, it's all good. I appreciate it's it. It's all good. We'll, we'll nab you yet. I have no Sounds doubt about good. it. Sounds good. All right, my friend. Well, welcome. And thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of all things Sacred Symbols Plus and Last Day Media. Couldn't do it without you over on Patreon. Almost 13,000 of you over there now. Um, nice. Thank you so much for your love, kindness, and support of all things we do. Um, this is for you, of course. And I wanted to have you on, Hogue, because we were talking on sacred symbols just the last episode we were talking the newsome stuff the gavin newsome activision stuff came yep. came about which we're going to talk about first but i was saying and admitting readily i'm like i'm way over my head on this like i don't really even know what to say at this point so we really deferred and it was last night when i was like why am i why haven't i just why don't i defer more quickly and so i <laughs> I, I texted you and i'm you like did? We'll get, i got get that. this going yeah we'll get this going right now so there are four things i want to ask you about and you know this already but for the yep. audience we're going to talk about activision and gavin newsom and the kind of the complaint out of california that happened recently with activision i also want to talk about their qa testers being brought on full time and the snubbing of raven which i thought was very interesting and uh you had brought up when we were talking last night talking about the bungee dmca uh thing i think will be really interesting as well. And then finally, I want to end with talking about the Embracer group who told the Financial Times that they want a lot more than they already have, which is unimaginable. So let's start at the very top with this sure. Activision Gavin Newsom stuff. I will lay out just a small part of what I understand and then I'm going to kick it over to you. But for the audience that's catching up, of course, Activision uh, Blizzard accused of a series of, I don't know, you you'd call some of them sexual impropriety, some of it just workplace mis, mis, you know, malpractice, all this kind of stuff wrapped up in this complaint in the state of California. That's parallel to this federal complaint that I guess was with the U.S. Equal Opportunity Commission, uh, which was solved, right? $18 million or settled for $18 million, which was presumed to interfere with California's litigation or what they were pursuing. And this woman named Melanie Proctor, who worked at the Department of Fair Employment and Housing in California, um, basically resigned in protest, saying that her boss, I guess, was fired, perhaps as a result of them pursuing Activision, that Gavin Newsom, the governor of California's office, was involved in trying to kind of manipulate things and uh, pursuing their uh, right right on down to the brass tacks, like pursuing their their uh, strategy and what they were going to say and do in court and all of this. And so she quit in protest. Now, the state of California and Gavin Newsom's office denies these allegations. I guess the crux of it is that this um, let me see here. I want to get it right. Department of Fair Employment and Housing extracted $100 million out of Riot Games. Yes, it did. For similar allegations. Riot yes. Games in Santa Monica, of course, in California. And the U.S. Equal Opportunity or Equal Employment Opportunity Commission got $18 million out of Activision, which they felt was a super low number and potentially could also ruin any ability they had to go after Activision in tandem. Do I have this all right? Is this yeah, like I generally... mean, there, there's some pronouns there in terms of like just making sure we're clear. So when you yeah. say they thought it was a super low number, you're talking about California's department. You're talking about right. a, a lot of folks that are observing this. The EEOC is acting under a different statute, the federal statutes. They have very specific caps on what they can go try to get for the laws that are under their purview. Uh, and that's $300,000 a person. And they also weren't doing uh, a claim that was as broad as California's. So the one thing that California has, the EEOCs didn't have is systemic discrimination. 
uh, pay discrimination, hiring, termination, that kind of thing that is within the course of actually conducting a business, but that California has alleged was done against women at the company, paying them less, hiring them fewer times, promoting them less, that kind of thing. That's not a part of the EEOC's settlement. That's not a part of what the EEOC was looking at. So the one thing I tr tell people on my channel is the EEOC is looking at very specific instances. You have to tell them this was your sexual harassment experience. You were discriminated against on a pregnancy basis. That's all they looked at. Or the broader umbrella, you were retaliated against for one of two of those things. Versus California, that's kitchen sink. Everything ever, discrimination, sexual harassment, all these various things. California gets upset because as the story goes here, and we've got two very angry agencies yelling at each other, but as the story goes here, when their investigations start a few years back, the EEOC and the DFEH agree to split into the EEOC looking at harassment and the DFEH looking at discrimination. The DFEH, as we know, when they filed their lawsuit first, included harassment in their claim and then got mad that the EEOC had harassment in their claim. The EEOC says, hey, that's what we were supposed to be looking at. And then the state of California tries to intervene legally to stop them from settling with Activision. And the big problem there on a broad strokes kind of basis is that the settlement with the EEOC doesn't require any woman to not participate with the state of California if they want to pursue their claim with the DFEH's action. So it was always a voluntary basis. Uh, and they can go and they can claim whatever their portion of that $18 million would be. And they don't have to do it blind. The process is they submit what their experience was at Activision to the people that are looking at this at the EEOC. The EEOC gives them a number that would be what they would participate in with respect to the settlement. And then they can decide to release the harassment claims or not. State of California flipped out, said that's not OK because those people are part of our harassment claims and we don't want to lose leverage and all this various stuff in our case. They try to interfere. And as I said, both the EEOC and the judge in this case say, what are you talking about? These women can go with you, but you don't own these women's experiences. If they mm. decide to settle with the EEOC, it's them that need redress, not you, state of California. Okay. So if they get that redress and they're happy, back off. And the state of California got smacked and smacked and smacked, and they didn't do what the judge said. They're, they weren't allowed to file an intervention. They were supposed to file an amicus brief, which is a short kind of, here's why this is an important matter and help the court make its decision. They instead filed what is by all practical purposes, an intervention that got the judge mad. They continued down this path. And what's important to understand about that is that the EEOC and the DFEH have a history of working together. When the EEOC does something, they work with whatever state's agency is doing the discrimination and the harassment laws in that state. So this is a common kind of relationship that needs to continue on in California. And it was strained to the point of fracture during this fight. This was an awful look for ultimately both sides, but really precipitated by the DFEH. That, that's part of the background here because you've got the two lead attorneys that have been one fired and one resigned in light of what they claim is interference and all this various thing. There are clear mistakes that the state of California made in this litigation that it really depends on how you feel about Gavin Newsom at the end of the day and his executive branch offices about whether or not they are corrupt and in the pocket of big Activision and Bobby Kotick or whether they look at the situation and said, you, you, you killed a longstanding relationship. You're doing these various things that are putting the state of California in disrepute with not just Activision, but other companies that operate here. What are you doing? Let's get this under, under control. And if you look at what was leaked out of this email, the, the most basic of claims about interference that came from Melanie Proctor is they started asking us to tell them in advance what our strategy was going to be, what we were going to do in litigation, these various things. And, and one of the things I did in my video on this in virtual legality was I went through the state of California's constitution. I looked at the various ways in which their code sets up these departments. And what's important to understand is that the Department of Fair Employment and Housing is an executive branch office that is designed by statute and the California constitution to affect the power of the executive branch whose head is governor of California. They are a functional arm of using the governor's power to do what the executive would do in California. So when you see these articles that say, well, uh, Ms. Whipper, who was the one that was fired, was fighting for our agency's independence. And then you analyze it from a legal perspective. You say, well, you don't have independence from the governor. The governor is the right. boss's boss's boss. That is the head of the thing. Now, that doesn't mean he couldn't be bribed. He couldn't be co-opted. He couldn't be corrupt. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean you have to take with that grain of salt when you read an article like that. This is an ex-employee clearly feeling put upon. And the one thing I added to my video on this was, look, as a lawyer, I would feel put upon. 
all right, I've decided my strategy. I've gone down this road. This is what I'm doing. And then the governor starts asking to look over my shoulder as to the decisions I'm making. 100% I would feel put upon. Don't know that I would accuse him of corruption going out the door, but I would feel put upon. That said, I, I do think some of the reports coming out aren't really recognizing end of the day, an executive branch agency is run by the executive. And there are legitimate reasons at bare minimum as cover that the DFEH gave to Gavin Newsom's office to allow him to do a move like this, because there were massive, massive problems in how this was handled there. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, it, it seems to me, first of all, two things. It seems that the palace intrigue, there's really no no smoke there at all, because they're really just, you serve at the pleasure of the governor in this case. And of course, they're going to have some sort of control over your office. I hadn't really even thought about the perspective of protecting your relationships because you had said bring California into ill repute with other companies, but certainly in ill repute with the federal government. Oh, yeah. Which the is EOC's not pissed. a good position for them to be in. Um, oh, it wouldn't surprise me if the EEOC state. made that call. You know, honestly, right. one of the counters, and in case you didn't follow this that closely, or if I haven't mentioned it in this space before, one of the things that happened from California fighting against the EOC, is the EOC brought a conflict of interest and sanctions claim against the state of California because they had taken two EEOC lawyers and put them on this case, even though they had been on the same case at the EEOC side, and then used them as part of the lawsuit, the intervention against their prior employer with the knowledge that was ever in their brain against the EEOC. So that's the biggest foul that you can actually have in the practice of law is a conflict of interest that is directly adverse. And they set that up. The EEOC lost their minds. They're like, this is this is incredible. Activision tried to use it to stop the case as well. They said, hey, by the way, there's there's like a conflict over here. We should we should stop all of this. Uh, and the judge said, no, sit, sit down, Activision. Uh, but it became a fight. And the state of California kept pressing it. They're currently in the Ninth Circuit appeals to try to overturn this settlement uh, agreement. I don't know whether that will continue or not. But there was never in my eyes. And, and this isn't saying anything about how you feel about $18 million, what the EEOC did. You can hate it. But from a legal point of view, there was nothing in my eyes that said California should be able to intervene in this at all because it, it, it's up to the women and the EEOC can settle its own claim. So California was never in a good spot on this. And they just got uh, more and more aggressive as the filings went on. So I, I, I am very sympathetic to both the people that look at this and say, oh, man, this is this is Activision deserves to be looked at closely for some of the stuff that's come out. They do. Everybody who's interested in justice should want redress for women that are negatively affected against the law in the way that they are working at Activision or the experiences that they had. But there's a right way to go about it and there's a wrong way to go about it. And California was tripping across some lines pretty good. And the biggest problem with that, as you can see right now, is I can't tell you whether there's corruption from the governor's office because there's so much cover given for a move like this. Right. There's it's entirely within legitimacy based on what I've seen about how DFEH was operating to say, yeah, this isn't. This isn't the way this should be done and to fire the lead attorney. And then if the second, which is what happened, if the second resigns, well, that's that's what it is. But I also don't blame anybody for looking at this and saying, well, you, you just cut the legs out from the Activision case. You did in an important way. Uh, and so I I think I finished my video saying the important part is you can read this one of you can read this one of two ways broadly. And you shouldn't assume that you can necessarily tell which way it is just sitting here on the outside, as bad as you might think it looks from whatever you're being told by whatever outlet. Yeah, that's fascinating. Is, is there is there a is there an element to this, too, that suggests that there might not be that much here compared to what was going on at um, at Riot, for instance? Like, is there any suggestion based just on on the events as they've unfolded, indicating that maybe this is kind of the penalty that fits the crime, if, as it were, that maybe the crime, I'm not saying it's five times worse at, at Riot or something. I'm just saying, like, is there any indication that that's part of why they're, in other words, it seems like they're working on behalf of the corporations, like at the governor's level in California, right? But is it possible that there's this thing, like, we, we see the evidence, we're privy to everything too. We feel like you, and I think you said, like, we feel like this is kind of fair. And, I don't think you fire the head of the department for that. Um, yeah. So this is the this is their head lawyer, and she had pursued riot. She had pursued things against Tencent. She had pursued Activision. Uh, I don't think you fire the lead lawyer unless you think there's a more systemic issue that it really rises above the level of just the Activision case. To be quite frank, interesting. Um, so I don't really think you can read anything about the the bottom line Activision stuff. I mean, you can you can go on my channel and look at my analysis of the original complaint. I think there is weakness in the discrimination complaint. They try to compare. Uh, different officers' salaries to various uh, other people that are in different jobs. There are things that are weak uh, about their case. 
Uh, but if anything, I think the EEOC settling part of their sexual harassment complaint is suggestive of there being real sexual harassment complaints that California can win uh, on. So I, I don't think it's I don't think you should read anything that happened in the news just now as really telling us much about the facts on the ground at Activision as much as politics and fractured relationships and ultimately, really ultimately loyalty, right? Because what was coming out from that email was she tried to defend the agency's independence, right? And if you're the executive branch officer, if you're the governor and some rogue employee tries to take a department in a way that you don't want, the buck will stop with you. Uh, in the uh, in the governor's office. And realistically, you have a role to say, if you aren't doing what we think strategically, the overall executive branch thinks it, you should be doing, and then you try to take your employees and say, we're going to fight the governor's office, at some point, you, you do have to terminate that employee because it, it's your role to make sure everybody's rowing in the same direction. Is that the right direction? I'm not living in California. I don't know Gavin Newsom from Adam, but it is a direction that the people elected and you don't just want the department heads and various appointees and employees going wherever they want. Um, that's that's kind of the nature of a democratic institution. And so I, I don't get the same ire that I've seen reported on in places on this. Uh, I'll have you know, I lived in Gavin Newsom, San Francisco and Gavin Newsom's California. All right. Uh, was he a mayor? Yeah, he was the mayor of San okay. Francisco. Yeah. He's an interesting guy. Two things. I guess this would be kind of like 1A, which would be. Am I crazy in, in in having read about this that the news reporting seems to be very one sided? Like no. the, what you're saying to me seems much more layered and different than what I was reading. Like like I guess everything about written about Activision is just the assumption that it's the worst possible conclusion. It's evil, right? When you yeah. start out with this body is evil, and I'm not necessarily saying that's entirely wrong with some of the stories that came out, but when you start out with that you look through that lens. And I don't think you're wrong there. I, to be frank, part of the reason I started talking about these issues was I saw at bare minimum a lack of nuance in how these things were taken as well as some just flat, flat error. Uh, but yes, I, I think that you start with Activision is evil. Anything that prevents us from you know hanging them from the nearest noose is a problem. And this is a step backwards. I think that's overall what you see as, as kind of the thesis point for a lot of reporting, which i sympathetic to. You know, emotionally, I can understand that. Uh, but I think it's more helpful to readers and viewers and listeners to say, here's how this could have gone. It's probably not as black and white as you might be reading. Yeah, that would be nice, but you know, maybe a little too much to ask. And then I guess 1B would be just in relation to the Microsoft deal. Yeah. I still am of this mind that, and I know that there's like more kind of little corners saying like, we, we want you to vote against this deal. We don't want this deal. People that I guess own. Very Microsoft little. If you're talking about SOC. Yeah. I, I might right. talk about that further. Um, and I just wonder if this idea I brought up on Sacred has any salience, which is why is Microsoft exposing themselves to a company like this? I know we've brought, I know we've brought this up in the past and I know Microsoft is just so much bigger and they're going to absorb them and that will probably overwhelm the, the Activision culture and become the Microsoft culture, which is a pretty positive culture by all accounts, but especially for the, a company of their size, the same thing with Apple and other places, like they're supposed to be great places to work. So I have no problem from that perspective, but I find it weird. Like it's, is this not almost like a form of, I don't want to like speak out of term, but like, it's like moral hazard for Activision, isn't it? Because they're getting away with it, right? Like they're like, they're all getting there. Like if there's anything truly bad happening there, they're just all getting bought out. And then brought and absorbed into this company in a very capitalistic, craven way to get Call of Duty and all of this shit. And I just feel like, is anyone going to call that what it is to me? I just, if I were Microsoft, I feel like I know that what they want, I know what they want. And I know that it's worth something to them. But yeah. I also feel like there's a move to be made, which is to say, like, we don't want it. We don't want this company anymore. You know, yeah, like, I mean, like it, it, well, I, and, and I feel like you could win some goodwill by doing that as well. But I'm, I'm curious what you think of that. Is there anything there? I was going to say the craven capitalistic response to even that would be, well, we don't want it because we want we want to break them uh, and then buy them for cents on the dollar, uh, which might well be what happens to Activision if you send them back out into the wilderness at this point. Uh, that said, I mean, I, I think the, the corollary question of that, and you don't have to, to answer this specifically, is always, you know, what would you see happen to these people that potentially ran this kind of toxic environment? Because the normal way out of this in corporate America, and you can make whatever commentary you want on that, is yeah, you get them the hell out of there. And if they own the shares and you have to pay for them, you get them out and you cleanse. 
Um, and I'm always of the view, I'm kind of on the EEOC's side of this uh, to some extent, which is they take a philosophy that says, let's get these women redress. Let's get them the damages that we can get them and let's get them in a better working environment. Let's get them to a better place. So I'm always kind of reacting to the SOCs of the world, or you might have seen there was a senator's letter to the FTC that talked about labor power and things like that. And I look at it and I say, if this is the worst place on earth, if this is evil, then the change in management, even if you wind up with more money in certain people's pockets and you don't feel like they fully got justice, isn't it a better end to have fewer people involved in an environment that you think is really problematic for them? And so I, I kind of try to balance it that way and say, yes, maybe you've got a moral hazard for people running Activision the way that they did. There aren't a lot of Activisions out there, but as soon as it became exposed, you really had them take a dive. You got them out of there. Uh, even the money that Bobby Kotick at all will be making is a lot less than if they had all liquidated a year ago. Uh, so, I mean, in paper wealth, they lost, even though they have a lot. But that's also because, to give full credit without talking about toxicity and everything else, you know, a lot of these people were involved with the company for decades. Bobby bought it out of almost bankruptcy and really did accrue value at the company, made it something valuable. And he's collecting some portion of that. Sure. If, if you're not going to bring criminal charges, then everything south of that looks like this. So I, I really can't hold Phil's feet to the fire. I really can't look at Microsoft and say, yeah, that doesn't work for me. Uh, but I can note that there are in really interesting instances like at the Dice Awards when they're, they're talking about toxicity and whatnot. And then Phil wins Lifetime Award. It's like, well, Microsoft really is making this happen. Uh, but... I just don't think that there's another better way to do it, at least in the structures that we have today. Yeah, I, I agree with that. A lot of people say that, that it's just, this is the best possible outcome for most of the people involved. And, and I like to focus on the women. I, I really do. Yeah, I mean, if, sure. if, if that's the life they led, let's get them out of there. And and Microsoft, people say, well, they've had their own issues and they're a giant corporation and all giant corporations have issues. Any really large body of people has issues. But as you said, a lot of good reports on working at Microsoft in most instances. Uh, and to be honest, uh, if it's horrible now, rolling the dice on it not being horrible, still advantageous. Uh, so I, I'm in favor of the cleansing action. I'm in favor of them getting redressed. I'm in favor of them making their own decisions. You don't want the EOC money. You think that's too small. Go with California and see what happens. They've had some great success. Uh, but uh, no, I obviously differ from California's strategy there. Fair enough. We'll stick with Activision. Sure. I want to ask about the unionization stuff as promised. Mm -hmm. On April 7th, the company, the publisher announced that 1,100 QA testers at Activision Studios, uh, quote unquote, US-based temporary and contingent QA mm -hmm. will become full-time as of July 1st. And as of the time, around the time that this podcast will go live, they will all start making $20 an hour at least. However, it seems like it might be in some way retaliatory. Um, towards one specific group, which is the Raven QA, Raven Studios, of course, in Wisconsin. Their QA was that the the head, the the phalanx of the fight to get this money and to get pro unionized protections, which aren't happen, isn't happening. They're just getting more money, which is nice, and benefits, which is nice. But some people are looking at this as uh, a retaliatory move. But Activision claims that they can't extend a lot of this new benefit structure because of the National Labor Relations Act. And Activision's now, right, I'm sorry to say. Well, this is what I was going to say was from layman's terms, I was like, there's no doubt in my mind that they're totally right, that this is a, something where they're like, we can't, we literally can't. But I think they're saying it with like a Cheshire cat grin. A like, little bit. Oh, yeah, no, well, like we we can't. And, and, and I do think it does serve the purpose of breaking the union. I don't know if that's actually going to happen, but what do you think? Well, so I think first and foremost, it's important to understand why they can't. And it's a little counterintuitive. And I'm, I'm not a, uh, a unionization lawyer. I'm not a labor lawyer. Um, but I, I have looked at these statutes. I have talked about them at, at length before. The, the basic notion, the easiest way to explain it is you can't do things for people that are engaged actively in trying to form or recognize a union because that's essentially a form of tampering. Right. That that's effectively bribing them to not vote for a union. And there's precedent that you wouldn't believe where uh, a small, a close corporation with maybe 15 employees says, hey, you, uh, boss comes in, and says, hey, are you thinking about forming a union? Uh, they say, yes. They raise their hands and say, well, well can we talk about what it is that you'd be looking for from a union? So, well, we want more of these benefits. We want this particular salary structure, blah, blah, blah. Guy says, you know what? Those are totally reasonable. I'm going to do them for you. Does them get sued? 
and, and loses against the NLRB because they said, well, once you're in that conversation, you, you cannot give them that because they're contemplating forming a union. And they, that's tampering at that point. That's unfair mm-hmm. labor practices. So right now, the current status of the Raven QA testers is that they have both been in a hearing with the NLRB to determine whether or not they are a proper bargaining unit. Uh, because there are very specific rules about what is the denominator for the vote, right? Is it QA testers? Is it everybody in the company? Is it everybody in a department? There's various rules that come into play. And I, I talk about that as well, because QA testers at Raven is probably not the the right bargaining unit based on uh, NLRB precedent. So we'll see what they wind up saying coming out of that hearing. Activision has been pushing for a higher denominator. Hey, if we're going to be unionized, it has to be all a Raven. If we get that denominator high enough, as you can imagine, Activision says it's harder to get to that majority number, whatever that is. Uh, and so that's framed in certain places as union busting, not entirely inaccurate. They would prefer not to have a union uh, at Raven or working in their company, but everything they have done, as best I can tell, right? There's something that could be happening behind the scenes or behind closed doors. Everything they have done publicly is within their power, right? The First Amendment protects them. They're allowed to say, here's why we don't like a union. Uh, They're allowed to do things like, I think they also announced a little while ago, they were going to embed the QA testers uh, in their various departments. They used to have a QA department. Now they're going to have testers in each department based around what they're testing. Uh, That was attested to as part of the hearing that said, hey, that's actually something that a lot of video game companies do. That's pretty wise. They, They found efficiencies there. But in the context of a QA group trying to unionize, you split them up, you you, you put them in different places. Uh, And so that's been reported on. Again, I don't think entirely inaccurately, but similar to your question on the the Activision and Gavin Newsom issue, there is clearly a bent in the reporting on this that says unions great. Uh, And unions can be great. Unions can be bad. I, I, I try not to get into that because they're very specific to different work environments and what these employees actually want. But the reporting on this is very much everything that is a step back for that potential unionization is Activision being evil and and going forward. But Activision is 100 percent right that says we have to avoid even the smallest indicia of tampering with their potential election, not only because that would get us in trouble with the NLRB, but as we get in trouble with the NLRB, you know that journalistic outlets would rip our heads off, even though we would be trying to do what they suggest that we should be doing right now, which is, oh, this is punishment to them. You should be giving them those benefits and rights. If we did that, the NRB would would absolutely cream us. Right. So this is the worst possible. I mean, I'm sorry, the best possible outcome for them of, of kind of bad decisions that they know they will because they knew when they when when the Raven vice president sent that email out. They knew that it was going to get leaked and then they knew that they were going to have to deal with it. But they were just probably thinking, from my point of view, well, this is the least bad. Well, I think your Cheshire right Cat now. description is probably right. Activision probably is is relishing that a little bit, um, but they're not allowed. I mean, I mean and, and their, their prospective union reps for the QA testers at Raven probably, if they're doing their jobs, told them that as well that evening that said, no, once we're in here, once we're in it, uh, you can't go get those things uh, on the outside because the, the, the company would get in trouble. Um, but don't worry, we're going to win the vote, you know, you know, whatever it is that they say uh, as part of that process. So I agree that it looks bad. I agree that it's fundamentally um, uh, looking union busting E. It's in fact kind of the opposite. They have to remain neutral uh, to avoid uh, looking like they're bribing potential union voters. Yeah. And I also think that if you look at Activision Studios or Activision as a company as some sort of like forest and part of it is on fire, they built a fire break around it and then just said oh well that will stop the rest of the forest from setting on fire and we'll worry about the fire now i think their response was even like this is this is unique to raven right i mean like they said something specifically like that's just that portion of the forest if you will uh so yeah i think that's i think that's right The, the other thing to their advantage is that they they have said in a number of communications throughout this period uh, that they were planning on making more ftes out of uh qa employees and that that was always part of the that was always part of the concept. You can you can believe or disbelieve that as you will, uh, but that's been said in a number of communications. So this wasn't a surprise. They had set this up um, over the course of a couple of, of either press releases or blog posts or, or things like that as things heated up during walkouts and, and whatnot. Well, shout out to the 1,100 people that are going to live a much better life now. Yeah. Um, and it's worth noting that it's not all bad for Raven because as I understand it, Raven is already, Ra- even Raven Freelance QA or Contract QA has access to the profit sharing um, uh, 
Activision structure or structure at Activision, which I think is the biggest piece of the puzzle since that's where the most money can be made. I mean, and, and one would imagine yeah. if they turn down unionization that then this would kick in for them. Now, you don't, yeah, exactly. You don't have and they there. have to know that in the back of their heads now. I don't think Activision really needs to say any, and I mean, they can't, they can't, they, they're they don't not allowed have to, to say, say that. Any, right, exactly. But they have to know that they, they that they know, they know, they know. Right. Yeah. Like, no, this they, is what's waiting for you now. You don't have to go through any of this anymore. You're talking about were, bribery. Don't vote it down right. and we'll give you some money. No. <laughs> exactly. But it's, as far as like, like if I'm at Raven and I'm part of the unionization drive, it might be hard to swallow my pride, but you might want to be like, you know what? We don't really need this now. I mean, we kind of won. Right. Well, and that's but, the busting effect. Right. Like right. The, the, the other side of this coin would say, well, that was what they were doing, Colin. And, I, you know, they're not wrong. They're not. Activision sure. isn't dumb. Um, and so. Yeah, it, it's it, they're acting within the ambit, as I understand it, of the National Labor Relations Act, but they're doing it in a way that they're trying to avoid unionization. And there's lots of companies that do, including, by the way, Microsoft. Sure. Yeah, everyone. I mean, uh, well, we'll leave it for another time. We'll leave Activision. We'll, we'll, I'm sure, touch on them again in the future. But let's move on to Bungie. Sure. And this Digital Millennium Copyright Act situation from late March, it actually started to bubble. So to set it up for the audience, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Bungie is suing at least 10 right now, anonymous and shielded. John Doe's, yeah. Yeah, John Doe's that um, I guess are going to be served subpoenas and discovered that way. I don't know, but. Um, oh, I can talk about they, that too. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to <laughs> learn more about all of this. But apparently what's happened is that this group, this small cadre of people, potentially in retaliation for a earlier DMCA uh, strike, a series of strikes about soundtracks having to do with Destiny, started falsely claiming a bunch of stuff on YouTube causing mass chaos in the Destiny community and in other for other websites that deal with Destiny footage and Destiny music and all of that. Mm -hmm. And so Bungie wanted to get pretty serious about this. And I think it's really interesting. I think most companies would take it on the chin and move on, maybe just to kind of hope that it doesn't happen again. But they're pursuing these people saying that I think they use the term incalculable damage, which I don't understand how that's possible. But, but destiny is um, just infinite money. You know, it's incalculable. Right. You can't tell. Like, I'm like, it was incal. Like, they were like, we, I'm like, I don't think that that's true, but. It just means uh, you want your statutory maximum, Colin. That's, that's right. Exactly. When, we, when, when lawyers use incalculable, it's whatever the maximum is, Judge. Which is $150,000, <laughs> right? And that comes from the per, per, per instance. Per yeah. instance, right? Per takedown. And I remember that number from the early 2000s, which I'm sure you remember too, when just random people started getting sued by you know through comcast or through other companies that were giving them up for downloading movies and music this was happening yeah, this was happening like 2003 2004 2005 and people were getting sued for like 25 million dollars and it's like some grandma I and mean, she's like i don't know and that's right right with, with, with her right. with her cd collection of burnt cds in a, right. in a binder yeah no and that's the infringement side of things right and infringements always look like that large number especially if it's malicious you know what you're doing uh against every instance that you do it uh, but yeah, there's so much weird stuff happening here because it's the middle of March. And if, if you don't play Destiny, uh, short, short version of this is that their lore is inscrutable. <laughs> you can't tell what's happening in Destiny. So they have a number of video community members that frankly use a, a lot of Destiny content that is Bungie's intellectual property to make lore explanations to make commentary on the video games. And there are people with millions and millions and millions of subscribers that get millions of views on every time they put something up. They started to get hit, which is when I take notice, right? Because I'm like everybody else. You know, you the small ones. So. No, I, I actually got a lot of messages from small uh, Destiny YouTubers <laughs> on this as well. Uh, but um, they start getting hit. And so I start looking at the terms of service. I start analyzing what Bungie's got. And Bungie has, this, has the same setup as a bunch of different companies that I, I complain about fairly frequently in virtual legality that says the, the terms of service actually say you can't use anything. And then we have some kind of guidelines document or blog post or forum post that says, well, here are the things that you can do with our intellectual property. Uh, and what that means from a legal perspective is you didn't get the license that you need. You are infringing and we're not going to do anything about it as long as you swim within these specific uh, zones. And if you go outside those zones, then we might call you for infringement or we might strike your channel or do these various things. So I was using it again as a jumping off point for one of my personal kind of focuses in virtual legality, which is this, this should be, this should be better. If you're going to market for this company, they should give you a license to broadcast. That's completely separate from what this turned out to be, but that was how I got involved with it. Then I started getting uh, letters that were being sent from one or two people that were claiming the infringement. 
uh, that were claiming the that they had done the takedowns and that they knew that they were wrong and they were trying to show a lesson to Bungie. Bungie comes out with a story that says, none of this is us uh, and we're looking into it. And then I get a little lawyer on, on Twitter and I said, well, what do you mean none of it is you? Did you use a third party policing at the firm? Because we've seen that from Sony before right. with The Last of Us Part Two leaks where they used a third party IP policing firm and they wound up they wound up taking down tweets that featured the word golf club and, and things that were way beyond uh, copyright infringement and things along those lines. Uh, and so I wound up doing a whole series on that because that's, you know, th that kind of stuff is, is worrisome on the internet. Uh, and so I was looking at it from that perspective. Then Bungie comes out and admits that for the first half of March, they were striking music channels. They were saying, you can't just put our soundtrack up. Uh, and there were archivists that weren't even monetized necessarily that were taking soundtracks and putting them together. And Destiny has a branching soundtrack, so it takes some work and putting them on their websites. And they were getting struck. And it does look like we're a little bit vague on this, as, as I think your summary was good. Uh, it does look like somebody that got struck on those grounds went off and started hitting everybody else to get people to pay attention to this. The really interesting thing about this story from Bungie's perspective, however, is that the lawsuit is ostensibly against the John Doe's, but 99% of their complaint document is screaming at YouTube. It is, it is Bungie versus YouTube uh, for almost the entire document, but they don't sue YouTube because they don't really have a complaint to bring against YouTube. So they just want to argue with YouTube about how and it sounds like a it that sounds like a Reddit thread of a YouTuber somewhere. It's Bungie saying, you don't respond to my calls. Uh, you don't answer my emails. We've got major, major problems because as these people are coming out, essentially they're blaming Bungie. There's no reason not to. So there's huge amounts of social media that are like, screw you, Bungie. You gave us these guidelines. And we got that idiot Hoag saying he didn't give us the legal rights. So Bungie's within its rights to do these things. Uh, and you should pay more attention, streamers and things like that. And and all hell breaks loose in their community. It really does, as, as Bungie described it. That that really did happen. And Bungie says, this is your fault, YouTube, because you took an email address that was created today and you gave it the powers of our personal representatives and you didn't have any checks and you just ran it through. And so they're yelling at YouTube. This is probably, to Bungie's credit, if you like Destiny, great. If you hate it, this is still to Bungie's credit that they are spending their money with lawyers and legal fees to try to get YouTube to do something about fraudulent takedown notices. And I don't know if you've had a ton of experience with this, Colin, but I, I, I know people that ask me this question all the time that say, you know, I, I got struck by some dude claiming the Will Smith slap and and I get a I get a warning strike or I get a real strike and it takes a while for YouTube to even fix it if they do. And that's pretty rampant on YouTube. Uh, and it's and so, serious to get it for people that don't know. It's serious to get a strike on YouTube. You can only get three of them, and then you're done. Yeah, and um, with really without recourse, really. I mean, you can right. try to go into the black box. Every email that you've ever gotten from YouTube, if you have just a Gmail account or something like that, or Google, uh, it's the same with a YouTuber. They're they're black boxes. They they're they're all robotically written. And good luck to you if you can get somebody on the horn. Now, if you're Bungie, if you're a three billion dollar company, eventually they get YouTube's I think vice president of gaming to to come out and answer their questions. That that wouldn't happen for Hogue. That wouldn't that wouldn't even happen for Colin. I don't think. No, no, uh, no, definitely not. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I, to be clear, like the reason that we really don't deal. In, a lot of people ask, why don't you put B roll over your podcast and stuff? I'm like, yeah, I'm not fucking around with any of that, dude. Yeah, like because I'm not giving anyone any reason in any way to injure our ability to proliferate our information. Um, yeah, and so we just don't even go down that route because and I use you I could use clear your checks and then to you know you clear your checks you put it up right. Mm -hmm. Two years later, someone boom for like to strike you for it for it being up. And I'm like, there's just no way I'm giving anyone the angle to do that. That's that's literally why it's because of this broken system. And I did notice what you were saying. I guess uh, I'm smarter than I think, because I noticed when I was reading some of the complaint and like going through all the information, I'm like, wow, this really is all about how YouTube is totally broken. Yep. And um, now will they be able to unmask these people? So here's them? here's the second part of the fight, and I'm following it from afar. I, there's not really enough to cover like on a daily basis or, or anything right. like that for my channel. Uh, so the reason they made this lawsuit is that as part of the story that they give is that they wanted to find out who these people were specifically, right? They have some information. They know how the email was created. They know they know some vague things. But they want to be able to serve them papers, give or take. And YouTube said no. And I want to say, even though YouTube's getting yelled at throughout this complaint, that is that is correct from YouTube. If you really think about this in a different context, you don't want YouTube handing out your personal information because sure. some giant corporation is upset. 
Like they, they, Bungie's probably legitimately upset on all of this, and we can assume that their complaint is probably pretty accurate. But overall, you don't want YouTube saying, sure. You, you want them to say, get a warrant. And essentially what they wound up saying in a civil capacity is file a lawsuit and subpoena us. And then Bungie said, fine. And I, you get the impression that YouTube often says that and, and not often does, does the other party say, okay, fine, we'll file a lawsuit. So Bungie files that and then they subpoena YouTube and they're currently still fighting. As far as I know, it might've been updated, but the law moves slowly. They're, they're fighting. YouTube then de- declines that subpoena and says, no, we're not providing that information. So this is really about right now, Bungie fighting YouTube for that information. They want the information. They want to go after these people directly. Uh, And YouTube is being super cagey about it. To some extent, sympathetically, to some extent, you want them to be very, very, very careful with private data and and personal information. But by the time you got the lawsuit, probably should be responding to the subpoena. Don't know. Not lawyers for YouTube on this. Uh, But that's what this fight is fundamentally about. Will they get the information? If Bungie keeps on with this, if they are willing to throw enough resources and time at it, they will eventually get it. Uh, but as it stands right now, YouTube is throwing up some blocks. Yeah, I, I, it, I bring this example up often just because it's the maximal example, but it reminds me of the San Bernardino shooting and Apple when they Apple just refused, like even under court order and being sued by the federal government and cajoled by the FBI, they just would not unlock that dude's phone. Yeah. For, like, and because they just didn't like what it meant Yep. for kind of the lines at the rules. And so I, I appreciate YouTube's perspective on that. I totally do. And we'll see yeah, what happens. And that. that's the situation, but it's, it's important. You know, I, I'm glad we're talking about it because it's not just Bungie. It's not just destiny. We're not just talking about it because that's a Sony company. Eventually one presumes uh, as they go through their own review. Uh, but because this is really very important, this goes to Twitch. This goes to everything gaming about what can be shown, how it can be taken down, how the DMCA works. And, and one of the things I talked about at length is that YouTube while annoying to everybody on this question, is following the drawing that Congress laid out for them in the late 1990s. The DMCA basically says, take down quick, put back slow, do these various things, don't check whether or not this is actually accurate because we've got a perjury charge here, we got some teeth, you don't have to worry. If someone fills in the right boxes, signs the right stuff, do your thing. And then you won't have any liability for copyright infringement. And unfortunately, the way it's set up, the teeth aren't right, right? So you've got fraudulent stuff being taken down is much easier than getting at the fraudsters, that you you don't have the kind of liability that you would want to attach to this kind of activity because this is going to proliferate for as long as the law doesn't require the YouTubes or the Facebooks or the Twitches of the world to look a little bit more closely. Like... This one seems, at least as described by Bungie, is pretty obvious. They copied the way that our takedown emails work. They created it that day. Uh, It's a Gmail account. That's your company, YouTube. (laughs) You know, know, do a little due diligence on this. And and what Bungie really asked for as part of their lawsuit, I thought was was pretty pretty well thought, which is let's have whitelists. Let's have whitelists for takedowns, right? Let's so so Bungie says, we will tell you three people that can take down our stuff. If somebody tries to take down our stuff under our name. If, and it's not these three people, don't do it. Uh, and, and YouTube basically said, no. Well, YouTube hasn't said anything. That's part of the thing that Bungie said is they don't respond to any of our requests. They're uh, obnoxious. They're yeah. totally ob- and obnoxious. I find them totally obnoxious. And um, opaque, right? I mean, this is, right. this is the nature of- so. It's like, why wouldn't you want to have rules like and outlines of, of the way things work? Why wouldn't you want to do that? I think I, right I now they're just like, where are you going to go? Where, where well, are the course. network effects, Haas? Where are you going to go? <laughs> That's, I totally agree with you there. Does this bring up any issues about the DMCA generally? Like, I know there's oh, yeah. so much criticism about it not really being up to snuff for the modern era. I think there was a lot of criticism of it in the 90s and you know the fall of 98 when it was passed that it was not up to snuff. It happened quickly. I think a lot of people were scared. This was during the Napster era and like kind of the bubbling of all the peer-to-peer networks. Well, I mean, the DMCA th- is part of a – yeah. I mean, it, I think people are scared about copying, but – the DMCA and 230, those are the two statutes that I wound up talking right. about the most on my channel. Both of them need to be at least refreshed, not not taken down to foundations necessarily. There's a lot of good concepts here. We don't want what amounts to billboard companies to have to take on all the liability of what people put on their services, whether that's copyright infringement or worse. So there's there's good notions here. We, we want there to be YouTube's. That, that users can put stuff on and, and YouTube doesn't have to worry about losing its entire corporate pot 
if something bad is on their videos, but also they really need to be rethought for how big they are, how many people use them uh, and, and what the standards could be. You've got just, there's nothing wrong with the legislature of the, of the late 1990s, but we've now got 25 years of experience of what that looked like in practice. Nip, tuck, fix up a little things around the edges. I'm, I'm generally in favor of 230 as a concept. I'm generally in favor of the DMCA as a concept, but there are things that you can fix. Absolutely. And there have been, comp- I mean, I, I feel like companies co- like on a corporate level are abusing it less and less. I remember Sony went after that guy, George Hotz. Do you remember that? Uh, it was a, people have to look, it was, uh, H-O-T-Z was his name and he, he was jailbreaking PlayStation 3s. Okay. And Sony went after him with the DMCA. And yes. everyone, I remember people being like, what? And I, I actually think they settled. So, cause I don't think it was like, so people will remember that if people go. Look well, so at the that. funny I thing remember. about the DMCA, right? So we are yeah. talking about the DMCA as if this portion of takedowns and things on the internet is the only, is the only thing in the DMCA, like all congressional acts, it's really long. So, uh, circumvention of technological measures is also part of the DMCA. So going around and operating systems blocks and things like that is something that you can bring up as a DMCA claim. I would suspect it fell under, under that kind of ambit. Uh, but yeah, the DMCA is bigger than than just the internet focus. Five twelve is is the is the portion that I talk about the most. But I have talked about technological measures because uh, I also have discussed um, things like emulation uh, when Nintendo was taking down melee tournaments and things like that. Because emulation is not illegal; it's the ROMs that are illegal, right? Isn't you know what? Broadly, I'm going to right? give that to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So oh, we've already had this conversation. All right, yeah. I have to give you. Well, no, I, I feel like we did, but like, right? Isn't that <laughs> isn't that vaguely yes. the defense? Yeah, that's the that's broadly. Yeah, yeah you are you yeah. are allowed to go in and figure out how something works and kind of replicate it uh, on a functional level, uh, but you aren't allowed to copy those ROMs. So uh, it, it becomes a thing, right? Because I, one of the questions I had early on when I was when I was doing my videos was essentially. If, if I hold up my disc, am I okay playing the emulated version? And, and the answer is always stuck between legal and real politic, right? Which is like, uh, there's nothing in the law for that. But one, you have to live with yourself. You have to be able to put yourself to sleep. So that that's step one. If you can do that, that's 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 a certain amount of comfort. Two, realistically, is anybody going to come after you uh, for that kind of thing? No. Yeah, so, helpful. you know. <laughs> Try do do your best. The fact that you're asking, by the way, is also evidence of you trying not to to break laws. So that's great. Uh, but yeah, it's that's a, that's the kind of thing that you could absolutely add to to the provisions, right? Like, do, if you have a physical copy of this thing, then we're going to allow emulated transferability uh, as long as it's within the owner of of a physical copy of it. I mean, that would that would solve some issues for certain people that are using emulation. But here we are. I, I remember that in, in the message board eras uh, era of people being like, I have the real version of it. I'm like, whatever, dude. Well, sure and, I, and, and that's 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 different between moral and legal, right? What is right, right. is not always legal. Right. What is wrong is not always illegal. I, that's that's part of the story. Can you put can you put your head on your pillow and be okay with it? Is, is part of that story. And I certainly think people that are they're staring at their Game Boy Advance game while they emulate a Game Boy Advance game. I, I, I certainly right. understand their moral position. Let's go with that. Sure. <laughs> and we well, we've talked about all this before about emulation and and just accessibility and all the rest we'll get back into that one day i want to end with just a brief discussion on the embracer group sure the mega swedish company um now they told the financial times in an interview that they want to become much bigger and in this conversation and this is in fucking insane i didn't know that they were even this big they revealed that they have a 115 studios 115 studios with a 10 billion dollar valuation i actually think it's 9.9 billion dollars now here's where things get weird to me and why i wanted to talk to you about this okay they noted that since the beginning of 2020 they have made 62 of those 115 acquisitions for 8.1 billion dollars which is 130 million unless i'm my math's totally wrong 130 million dollars per studio i think that, this that sounds like it's in the right neighborhood yeah this doesn't make any sense to me so they spent eight point one billion on sixty two teams, but the one hundred and fifteen cumulative team structure is worth ten billion dollars. To me, this seems like they are spending and spending and spending and spending in hopes that they make this money back somehow. But I don't see that they're r- running in the black. This actually was the first time I ever looked at this and was like, oh, and got a little bit of an idea of what they're trying to do. I'm it wondering... sounds like a roll up, right? I mean, I, I, yes, they're, they're still in a roll up phase. So you've seen industries do this across all sorts of spectrums. Uh, and, and so you can collect a big pile of money and you could say, let's consolidate. Let's get 
you know, back end expenses, right? Let's get institutional knowledge up, whatever it is that we're going to do. We're going to consolidate all of this and potentially, depending on what you're doing with the roll up, you flip it, uh, you, you, you get something that's really attractive and then you sell it to Microsoft or Sony or whatever. Um, or you try to get something that's really functional that was somehow not working in the environment. And I think you've seen interviews across the industry now that is talking about why consolidation is happening, uh, that you need to get to up to a certain size in order to do various things in the industry. And, and I think Embracer has been a, a, a part of that. Uh, they are collecting all of, I don't know what I would call it. I, I used to call these companies double A, maybe single A. Uh, depending on what they are making. And I think they're doing some great stuff. The Embracer is usually what I think of as like kind of a little bit weird uh, in terms of the games, not not quite as polished as, as some of the bigger ones. Yeah, they, they have the old double A THQ, you know, acclaim uh, thing going it's, it's on. They, yeah. I mean, yeah. Embracer, I can see the, this should go to show how fast and heavy their acquisitions have been. I don't even know that I can I can remember like even the big ones that are over there, they own Gearbox now, right? Yeah, they own Gearbox now. Yeah. And they have 10 verticals, right? Okay. Like so Deep Silver, THQ Nordic, Coffee House, and all of this random DECA and all this random shit. Yeah. And then under that is 115 teams, including, and you'll be surprised to hear this, and this is what I really wanted to ask you, is they have 13 American teams making them the biggest first party in America. Like they own more American teams than so by number of more... teams, do right, we have by number of teams, employee by... size? I mean, like the I interesting thing I, about that. I would that. doubt it would be. I actually think it might even be comparable in employee size. But I was just – I wanted to ask you about the, the yeah. entities because they said in the conversation that they're really looking to America and a few other places, Poland, which is a great place, to great gaming hub now. Yeah, it is. But 13 of their 115 million studios means that that's fewer than 10%. Is this kind of accumulation of studios going to – is that going to attract any sort of regulatory attention or is it not really a big deal? Because that's why I brought up the 13 number. It was just based on a label, they're actually starting to roll up more than their competitors. And if they if they intend on doubling, like they said, then they will have a bigger American headcount than either Sony or Microsoft, which is – Headcounts – headcounts the – better indicia than just number of teams. And that actually goes to something that I was saying about problems with the FTC's review of Microsoft and being a monopsony on labor and things like that. Video gaming is, to its credit, awesomely kind of traversable. There are always teams breaking off and making new things and starting their own places and doing these various things. So if you have 13 teams and they're all 20 people, you know, that's a different calculation than, you know, buying blizzard at this point in time or any of the ubisoft entities have a couple hundred people in their offices at this point in time uh, so i really do think headcount's probably the focus because the, the focus of any kind of regulatory concern is are you creating some kind of single buyer or seller marketplace uh, and so if you're if you've got that many employees then you start to look as big because then you could you could make a bunch of 20 person teams. Right. Activision right now, we know that they're 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. They could run at, at least 20 teams if they wanted to doing various things. They think their money is best spent making Call of Duty for the most part. Uh, and they're probably not wrong, but they could they could leverage that if the market suddenly shifted on them. What, what a regulator is worried about is do you have untoward power that prevents any kind of competitor from from pivoting to match you? Uh, so employees matters there. If it suddenly became the case that everybody loved double A games of 20 person teams the most, Activision could immediately transform and throw double uh, A teams at you if they were so inclined. And so I, I really do think you're focused not on number of companies as much as you are on kind of market power size. Uh, that's why I look at $8 billion and I say big number. Billions of dollars is a big number, but you know Sony's buying Bungie for three. <laughs> Activision right. and Microsoft are working on their 70 bill one. Uh, you know, and, and so it, Embracer right now has the same cap as ZeniMax, Bethesda, when Microsoft bought them. And that was that was just a portion of the marketplace. And that's probably how they're best seen uh, right now is that kind of ZeniMax, Bethesda size. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think you're right about this idea that they're constructing something. They have some sort of plan. I think part of the plan is to make them very valuable in the streaming era where or in the subscription era where they have... They're just going to have a machinery of games and back catalogs coming out that will either make them enticing to be purchased outright, which might be the plan, or to just be a major player, like a Paramount style or movie house style play. Although Paramount has its own streaming service now, but some sort of player where they can be like, we have a real value to you on this service. I think um, that's very true and astute yeah. because you got part of the argument for consolidation here is gathering things to fight in the subscription landscape. 
uh, that there is a certain value of being able to put things directly into that, much like you saw realistically with TV, are still seeing with TV and the fight between Netflix and Hulu and uh, Peacock and HBO Max slash Warner Brothers Discovery. It, 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 we're in such an era of consolidation and change. You can barely remember the names of these things uh, uh-huh. as they as they move forward. And perhaps to some people's chagrin, I think you are going to see some kind of war like that uh, in video games over the, the near to medium term. Uh, and so that would make a lot of sense. Um, like I said, rollups can be built to sell. That's either way, the phase that you note where essentially the dollars are just becoming people and not otherwise moving anything uh, right. is a strategic process. I don't know how they're funded. This is this is kind of how you would do it with uh, some pretty strong private equity raises and things like that. I have, I have no idea what their financing is. But if you do have outside financing for a strategic plan, this is how it would look. Well, come by Lilymo if you guys are interested. Uh, yeah, that's right. We're, hey, we're don't don't offer it to me. Offer it to Embracer. Yeah, yeah. yeah c- come check we're, us we're out, Embracer. Embracer. <laughs> um, well, Mr. Hogue, that's all I have. I appreciate your time today. Very insightful. Um, where for for those unfamiliar with you until this episode, where can they find you? Absolutely. Well, as you you heard me reference a couple of times, we're talking about business and law, video games most prominently, but also technology and software and other aspects of pop culture over in virtual legality. YouTube.com slash Hogue Law. Uh, And this week, we've been covering a lot about Internet Wildcard Elon Musk uh, doing all sorts of stuff. And I would I would anticipate the next couple videos are probably going to be on that uh, as uh, as news has come out realistically while we were while we were talking about this. Yeah, I can't believe I didn't think they were actually going to do the poison pill thing. But Uh, yeah, well, so I did a video on that yesterday. See, I I always do love it. Sometimes you get to look like a wizard prognosticator. I did a video yesterday that said a hostile board would probably take up a shareholder's rights plan right now. And then in the next day, then you get those, you get those lovely comments that are like, Oh, I was like, yeah, well, I mean, it's it's not, I'm not a wizard. If they're going to be against him, that's what they're going to do. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, it seems it seems always very interesting to watch this. Yeah, everyone pay pay close attention to virtual legality and and Mr. Hogue, we appreciate you, Rick. Uh, thank you absolutely. So much for Thanks for the having time. me again. You're very welcome, and thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support again of all things Sacred Symbols and Last Stand. We'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC, and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.